Hello and welcome to this edition of The Current Report, a weekly roundup of what's happening in the world of digital media. I'm Damien Fowler. The heavyweight title fight between Disney and Charter ended in both sides shaking hands and playing nice. So this wasn't the total upending of the cable system that some predicted, though several analysts believe this deal leads to a future centered around streaming. To recap, this dispute kicked off after Charter blacked out all Disney-owned channels for its cable customers, including the much-prized ESPN, and it was over carriage fees. But the agreement settled that battle between the two sides and could be beneficial for both parties. But what does this latest dispute mean for the future of TV and streaming? Well, to answer those questions, we're bringing in our reporter Chris Brooklier, who spoke with industry experts for his latest story on The Current. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Damien. Always good to talk with you. So tell me, what stood out to you about this agreement and how can it shape the future of TV? It felt like Charter said, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. With this new deal, Charter subscribers will get access to Disney Plus and ESPN Plus with those subscriptions. But the key point here is that it's actually the ad-supported versions. So for Disney... This allows them to get more scale on their subscription um, tiers. And then also on the charter side, allows them to give more value for, for their customers. You know, we've seen in the last couple of years of the cord cutting era, millions and millions of subscribers have left cable. But for charter, this was something where they, they realized we can't just keep trying to go with this traditional model. We need to lean into streaming somewhat. So they're providing value to each other in multiple ways. So to be clear, Chris, Disney-owned channels at the center of this dispute were running on charter cable networks for their cable customers. But how come ad-supported streaming was a big question here at the center of this agreement? Ad-supported streaming is newer, but I think these streaming companies recognize that it is actually a big part of their strategy going forward in terms of making revenue. Mm. But we have to, we have to think that while these companies, the streaming companies, have been around for for years, the ad supported models are actually really in their infancy, right? So Netflix and Disney Plus, their ad supported models are less than a year old. So they're still trying to get scale. And Moffat Nathanson said that as of June, Disney Plus had about three point three million subscribers. So. By Disney giving access to Disney Plus to charter to charter subscribers, that opens up about 10 million subscribers that can now go to go to Disney Plus. And I think the really interesting thing here is while Disney is getting a, a lower wholesale price from Charter for those subscriptions, they're getting a hundred percent of the ad revenue. So this can really open up a whole new world of ad revenue for Disney to take advantage of. I see. Yeah. And then on the data side, this is also a, an important factor here because ad supported platforms, you know, have authenticated users or viewers, if you want, if you like. So that's, that's kind of very important here. Yeah, no question. So, you know, in the age of the internet, data is everything, right? Because it can teach you, tell you about your customers, who they are, what they watch. And one of the really interesting parts that I found reporting this story was I spoke with the CEO of BlockGraph, which is a data collaboration firm owned by NBC Universal, Charter, and Paramount. And what he told me was that these cable operators actually have a ton of identity data that's based in dip billing that they can use to share in a data privacy way with the content owners. Now, of course, we think that generally these cable operators don't have a ton of, of data in terms of the traditional TV metrics. But he said that, you know, distributors always knew who you were, but the difficulty they found was changing the, the advertising structure. So this is where Disney, Disney Plus comes in, right? So if you mix that that identity data with the ability that Disney Plus has to to lean into programmatic advertising. And that's where I think they come together. Chris, as you said earlier, we're at a crossroads in this cord cutting era. 
Can you tell me more about the kind of economics that these companies are dealing with in this moment? We are at sort of a middle point, right? Because at this point, linear TV makes a lot of money for these content owners, but they they all realize that streaming is the future. So I think what this deal does is if you zoom out, this could really show what these content agreements could look like in the future. You know, these these streaming services, once they popped up, they were spending billions and billions of dollars on development. And I think that that is hoping to be an investment that will lead to profitability, right? The only major streaming service right now that's profitable is Netflix. Now, Disney CEO Bob Iger said that he hopes and expects Disney Plus to be profitable by the end of next year. But going back to it, again, the, the advertising tiers for these streaming ser- services are really important because multiple CEOs of these companies from CEO, uh, from Disney to Max, they've said that the advertising models, they actually make more money for the companies than the straight subscription services. And that's because you get the dual revenue, right? You get the subscription revenue and you get the advertising revenue. So we could see this become a bigger part in the future of the streaming era. Chris, thanks so much for those insights. It's uh, it's an interesting moment for the industry and we'll keep watching it. Definitely. All right. Talk to you later. Moving from TV to retail. Luxury brands in Europe are pushing into programmatic. The brands are combining their centuries-old heritage with new marketing tactics to chase a luxury market that's expected to grow by more than 50% by 2030. That's according to consulting company Bain. But as you can expect, these brands are very protective of their reputations and their programmatic strategies show that. To see how they're diving in, head to thecurrent.com to read the full story. Next, here's our weekly roundup of what's making news across the internet. After 143 days, the writer's strike may be coming to a close. CNBC reports the Writers Guild and the studios are finalizing a deal to end the stalemate and bring back union peace, although the actors remain on strike. CEOs of Disney, Warner Brothers Discovery and Netflix all met with the Writers Guild this week. It was the first time the two sides have negotiated since August. Still, CNBC reports if a deal isn't struck soon, the strike could last into next year. The longest writer's strike in history was resolved after 154 days in 1988. And Warner Brothers Discovery is upping its game. New live sports offerings will launch on Mac starting in October. More than 300 games a year, from the NBA to NHL, MLB and more, will be available on the Max app soon. All that's coming at no extra cost for now, but by next March, it will be time to pay up, just in time for March Madness. At that point, live sports will cost users $10 a month. And all those games will be simulcasted, and for now, Warner Brothers Discovery Sports CEO says there are no plans to move games from traditional TV to streaming only. And that's it for this edition of The Current Report. For a deeper dive on all of these stories and more, check out thecurrent.com. We'll see you next week. Oh,